Good morning, and today we're going to look at Dracula, the history, the myth, and how Dracula is succeeding in a popular culture. So when we start looking at the idea of history, we're looking at Vlad the uh, Third, who is also known as Dracula, and that is around the time period of about 1431 to 1476. Now, even though there is literature before the 1897 Bram Stoker's Dracula, we're going to be focusing more on that and the things that come afterward. When we start looking at Dracula in theater, we're going to start looking all the way back to 1924 and 1927. And of course, we'll have to talk about the film series, starting off with Nosferatu and moving into Shadow of the Vampire from around 1922 to about 2000. So let's start off with the history. Vlad III was born in 1431 in Sig Sahara, Transylvania. Uh, he has the last name of Dracul or Dracula, which meant son of the dragon. Some people also say it might mean son of the devil. Now he's the second child of Vlad II Dracul, who's a void of Wallachia. Now Wallachia is a principality between the Danube and the Transylvanian Alps in southern Romania currently today. Um, it is basically a very mountainous type of a region. It was not very well populated at the time that Vlad was there. Now of Avoy, which is a prince and military leader, um, Vlad was that for three separate periods. Um, from 1448, from 1456 to 1462, and again at his death in 1476. Now, to Romanians, he's known as Vlad Tepes, or Vlad the Impaler. To Turks, just south of there, he's known as Kazagul Bey, or the Impaler Prince. Now, to impale somebody means it's it, basically to take somebody and just push th or run through uh, a big spear, perhaps take their heads off and stick them up on a spear, and this would be Vlad's preferred method of execution. Now, at the time, between the Ottoman Empire and Wallachia in current southern Romania, you would see lots of battles and lots of uh, changing hands of land going on. So the unified Wallachia lots of times resisted the Ottoman advances. Um, and because of Vlad III being in control, he's the guy who's going to be resisting a lot of the Ottoman Empire's advances here. So for some Romanians at the time, they would have considered him a very brutal leader, but still a leader. And he was killed while fighting the Turks near Bucharest in 1476. Now, during his second reign, he did murder between 40,000 and 100,000 people by around 1462. And by the mid 15th century, German, Russian, and Turkish pamphlets established his notoriety about the people that he killed. Now, we also have the stories in the frightening and truly extraordinary story of a wicked blood-drinking tyrant called Prince Dracula coming out shortly after his death. And in Nuremberg in 1488, we have, He had a large pot made, and boards with holes fastened over it, and had people's heads shoved through there and imprisoned them in this. And he had the pot filled with water, and a big fire made under the pot, and thus let the people cry out pitiably until they were boiled quite to death. And so we take a look at the picture on the right, you can see his preferred method of execution, which was to impale people. But we also see in the bottom of the picture where people are being chopped and hacked up. And we have Vlad sitting down to dinner next to all of this, giving the impression that perhaps he is eating all of these bodies. Now, nevertheless, he's considered an immortal heroic icon, but at this time, he was not associated with the idea of what a vampire was. That is not until you get to Bram Stoker's Dracula. Now, in November 8th, 1847, Abraham, otherwise known as Bram Stoker, was born in Clontuff, Ireland, and he attended Trinity College in Dublin. He put forth eight years of civil service until he was able to feel secure enough to start writing as a full time. And in 1872, he publishes his first story, The Crystal Cup. Now, in 1878, he begins managing Henry Irving at London's Lyceum Theatre, and at this point in time, he's able to concentrate full-time on his writing. So in 1882, he publishes his first book, Under the Sunset, and his first novel in 1890 is The Snake's Pass. 
He's not really well known across uh, international lines until we get to 1897 when Dracula itself is published. And in April 20th, 1912, Bram Stoker will die in London. So what does he look for in order to write his Dracula novel? Well, between the years of 1890 and 1896, Bram Stoker begins to research Eastern European vampire folklore, especially the Transylvanian myths. Now, he does start reading an account of the principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia, an extraordinary and shocking history of a great berserker called Prince Dracula, and the history and superstitions of romantic Romania. He also read The Undead and learned about Count Wampir. Now, after all of this, he then in 1890 also meets the Hungarian professor Arminius Vanberry. Uh, and so with all of that piece, all of that literature just starting to piece together the story of Prince Vlad III, of these ideas of there being vampires around this type of East, uh, Eastern Europe and at the time period, he starts putting together his story. But then he has syphilis in Victorian England, and so he takes some of the ideals of what that disease does to a person's body, and he starts putting that into his story as well. Bram Stoker actually never set foot in Romania, so he's never actually seen the places or has seen uh, any of the history. Uh, he's only taken it from books that he has read. And so we do have a lot of Bram Stoker's influences from things that he's done before, such as going out to sea. He, he did spend quite a bit of time uh, on the shores of Ireland, and he spent a lot of time working in London and Dublin, so he would know about ports. Uh, he would also think of the ideal of a castle up on a hill. Again, living in Ireland and England, they have a lot of the similarity or sameness to that. Um, we're also high in the Victorian period, so the idea of fantasy and imagination with dragons and with evil beings certainly would have been around in other stories of the time. So looking at the story Dracula itself, it's an epistolary novel. It has significant plot changes. So you have an episode after an episode after an episode. You could actually publish them chapter by chapter, and it would kind of seem like a, part, a, a short story, which is a part to a larger plot. At the time, it was only second to the Bible in sales. It was wildly popular. Everybody wanted to read Bram Stoker's Dracula at the time. And of course, it has now inspired or influenced over 700 films and counting. Bram Stoker's Dracula has never been out of print, and it has been translated into every major language in the world. And in 1985, Adrian Panescu said, Only one page in a vast output of political pornography directed against us by our enemies. It's an attack on the very idea of being a Romanian. So when we look at a different take on the ideal of Dracula, you look at the literature, The Count or the Vavoid from the 1897. Now, there's two major differences here. A Count is a castle in Transylvanian Alps, whereas a Vavoid is a castle in the Wallachia's foothills. And so when you think of the idea of Count Dracula, he's not a Count, he's a Vavoid. So a Count could also be of Skelly blood from the northern country, where a vote is an older Wallachian stock. However, there are two major similarities in the story. Count Dracula describes his royal heritage. He says, Is it a wonder that we were a conquering race, that we were proud, that when the Magyar, the Lombard, the Avar, the Bulgar, or the Turk poured these thousands on their frontiers, and we drove them back? To us for centuries was trusted the guardian of the front frontier of Turkeyland, I, and more than that, endless duty of the frontier guard. Now, Count Dracula alludes to an ancestor who sold his people to the Turks and brought the shame of slavery on them. Now, Vlad III, Dracula's younger brother, Radu, surrendered Wallachia to the Ottomans. So when we make a comparison here between Bram Stoker's Dracula and the Vlad Tepes of reality, you do see some similarities, but you also see Bram taking a bit of literary license. Starting off with Vlad Tepes. He was not very tall, but very stocky and strong, with a cold and terrible appearance, a strong and aquiline nose, 
swollen nostrils, a thin reddish face in which very long eyelashes framed large, wide-open green eyes. The bushy black eyebrows made them appear threatening. His face and chin were shaven, but for a mustache. The swollen temples increased the bulk of his head. A bull's neck connected with his head to his body, from which black curly locks hung on his wide-shouldered person. Strong man, not exactly attractive. Bram Stoker's Count Dracula. His face was strong, a very strong aquiline with high bridge of the thin nose and peculiar arched nostrils, with lofty domed forehead and hair growing scantily round the temple but profusely elsewhere. His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose, and with bushy hair that seemed to curl in its own profusion. The mouth, so far as I could see it under the heavy mustache, was fixed and rather cruel-looking, with peculiarly sharp white teeth. Well, these protruded over the lips, whose remarkable readiness showed astounding vitality in a man of his years. Huh. I believe I've heard that somewhere before. Moving on to theater with Dracula. Uh, in 1924, we get the play Dracula by Hamilton Dean, and it premiered in Derby, England. It was a very popular three-year tour. Remember, by 1924, Bram Stoker's Dracula has been out for an entire generation now. People know the story. So we have three acts set mostly in a drawing room in London, and the very first count that we have is Raymond Huntley, who put in over 2,000-plus performances. Now, our Count Dracula comes from a cadaverous, you know, almost zombie-like appearance to be looking absolutely charming, almost attractive. Now, an American entrepreneur, Horace Liverwright, bought the rights to the Dean production and then brings it over to the United States. Now, John Balderston, a young journalist and playwright assigned by Liverwright, Americanizes Dean's script and he tones down the theatrical dialogue, but the structure of the story remains. Now, Huntley turned down the role, so therefore we hire Bela Lugosi uh, because of the uh, speech patterns that you'd want to have Count Dracula. And in 1927, Dracula opens in Fulton Theater in New York City and runs for 33 weeks, earning over $2 million in 1927 money. That's a lot of money, especially when you look at the prices that people were paying for the tickets in the lower left side. Now, one of the first films we have that takes on the Dracula fil uh, film industry is Nosferatu. And we have Nosferatu, Ein Symphonie des Greons, The Undead, A Symphony of Horror. And it was directed by F.W. Murnau. Now, this is a German expressionist cinema. It is a silent film. It is the earliest surviving vampire film. Now, you have Max Schreck, the actor, playing Count Orlok. He's very isolated. He seems very withdrawn, almost a pathetic figure. Now, Murnau drew on popular vampire lore and Stoker's novel, completely without permission. So he changes the names and the setting in order to attempt to make it as different as possible. Now, Florence Stoker and the British Incorporated Society of Authors destroyed the original negatives and most of the prints. After all, we considered this plagiarism, but we do still have quite a bit of the original film to still look at for film history today. Then we move into the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, where all of a sudden the ideals of Dracula in the movies take off. We have in 1931, Dracula by D. Todd Browning, and it is the first authorized film adaptation from the Stoker family. Now, here we have Bela Lugosi once again portraying Dracula, and the script draws heavily on the stage play that he was in in 1927. Now, here in this particular play, Dracula is a suave, continental lover. He's very handsome. He's very charismatic. Women fall for him almost immediately. He's dressed in, in the appearance of a Victorian-era English aristocrat, aristocrat, which in the 1930s would have seemed a little dated, but at the same time, very romantic. And in this particular case, you see that the movie is omitting explicit sexuality. Uh, when he's going after the women themselves, you don't see them getting more than just the beginning of romanticism before he reveals how terrible it's going to be him being Dracula. Now, in 1958, you get the horror of Dracula, and that's by 
D. Terence Fisher. Now, Dracula is played by Christopher Lee, and there is absolutely significant changes to the novel itself. It becomes much darker. Now, when we look at other film interpretations uh, in the late 20th century, we see a second uh, chance at Nosferatu, uh, Phantom der Nacht, The Undead Phantom of the Night by D. Werner uh, Herzog, and The Count is played by Klaus Kinski in 1979. It is not set in England as Bram Stoker's is originally, but rather set in the Netherlands, and it's the first film to portray Dracula as almost a tragic figure. You feel bad like he's got everything set against him in the world. Now, Dracula is almost created by this kind of ideal of a plague being personified. There's no romantic power over the mortals that he uses. It's almost as if he's giving the Dracula powers as a plague to others. Now, Francis Ford Coppola decides to take Bram Stoker's Dracula and actually try to put it as faithfully in a movie as possible. Uh, the Count is now being played by Gary Oldman in 1992. It is the closest to the novel with the characters and with the telling of the journal entries with the voiceover. So therefore you do see a supernatural romance and you have bits of both Vlad the Third Dracula, the historical reference, and Count Dracula, the Bram Stoker novel uh, character. You'll also start seeing some parodies of Dracula. For example, in 1995, you have Dracula Dead and Loving It. Uh, the director is Mel Brooks and the Count is Leslie Nielsen. It was a parody where you are seeing this bumbling Count Dracula who doesn't quite know how he's supposed to go about and, and taking over uh, different lovers and different uh, people in order to change them. It wasn't exactly all that popular. And in 2000, we see Wes Craven presents Dracula 2000, directed by Patrick Lussier. The Count is Gerard Butler, and it's set in modern-day America. In the same year, you also get Shadow of the Vampire, uh, where you have director uh, Elias Merhang, and the Count is William Defoe. Um, and this is almost the remaking of Murnau's Nosferatu from 1922. And so here we have pictures of Vlad the Third or the Count Dracula from all the different movies. So now when we start looking at Bram Stoker's Dracula, we're going to look a bit at the characters. We're going to start with Jonathan Harker, a lawyer from London. Uh, he is sent to Transylvania to help Count Dracula buy a house in London. Um, most of the journal entries or in the movie, in the voiceover, you're going to hear from Jonathan Harker's point of view. But your main character that you have is Count Dracula. He's a Transylvanian estate owner looking to move to London. He is our vampire. And the character is inspired by the history of Vlad III, the Impaler from 1448, known for his brutality in battle. Now, his father was a member of the Order of the Dragon, or Dracul, which is an order of knights sworn to fight the enemies of Christianity. Dracula, however, means the son of the dragon. Next, we also have to have a love interest. So we have Mina Murray Harker. That is Jonathan's fiance, and then later in the book, his wife. She has a friend by the name of Lucy Westerna, who is killed by Count Dracula after his arrival in London. Mina is also becoming a victim of Count Dracula, and she helps Jonathan find Count Dracula and kill him. We also have the character of Abraham Van Helsing. He's a Dutch doctor, and he's also a vampire hunter. Now, Van Helsing comes to London to help hunt down Count Dracula and follows Dracula back to Transylvania and helps to kill him. So when we look at the plot of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Jonathan Harker is sent to Transylvania to meet with Count Dracula in his castle. Now, Dracula would like to buy an estate in London, so Jonathan Harker has already picked one out for him and brings him the papers to sign. Soon, Jonathan Harker finds himself held captive in the castle and begins to see weird and spooky events. Now, Harker manages to escape from the castle. 
but he's very ill, and so Mina Murray, his fiancé, comes to Budapest where he spends some time recovering with her. But we already have seen real estate has gone through, so Count Dracula arranges for his coffin and several boxes of Transylvanian soil to be picked up and put on a sailing boat to England. Now, the boat sails from July 6th to August 4th, where then it crashes on the shores of Whitby, England. All of the crew are missing and presumed dead. Now, the captain himself is found dead, tied to the steering wheel of the boat. All they find is the captain's log, which tells a gruesome tale of what has been happening on the ship. Now, Count Dracula himself has now arrived in London, and he begins preying on victims. Now, he finds a close friend of Mina named Lucy and begins drinking her blood in order to, create a, in order to get his strength back. Now, Lucy's fiancé is worried by Lucy's sickness and calls his friend Dr. Van Helsing to come and help. And Jonathan and Mina, now that Jonathan is strong enough, return from Budapest to find Lucy very sick. So then, as soon as he is starting to be found out, Dracula then turns Lucy into a vampire, and Van Helsing has no choice but to destroy her. So now Count Dracula starts preying on Mina in order to take revenge on Jonathan Harker. Now, this helps Jonathan and his friends find out who Count Dracula really is, and they destroy all his hangouts in London, so he has no choice to, but to return to Transylvania. So then Jonathan, Van Helsing, Mina, and some other friends arrive in Transylvania before Dracula's coffin. They are then able to destroy him by finding his coffin and destroying it, and Jonathan and Mina then return to England and live happily ever after. And that'll do it for the introduction into Bram Stoker's Dracula. If you'd like to learn more about the movies or maybe perhaps more about the story itself, chapter by chapter, please put down a comment in the comments below as to what more you'd like to learn. And as always, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed.